We've been talking about embracing revival, and I like that artwork very much. Do you know why? You see that Kahat beat, it's like something that's dying comes back to life. I've never really thought about the fact that reviving something is bringing it back to life. Yeah, that, that artwork, I looked at it today and I'm like, hmm, yeah, medically, that's revival. When they say they revived someone, it means, you know, they had to put those electric things on them and bring the heart to beat again that life had left them. And so in 2019, Benny Hinn, the man of God, prophesied while he was in Ghana, he gave a prophetic word and said that there would be revival in Uganda in 2022. Have you heard about that word? Now again, you can be so used to Christian things that you're like, amen, what does that even mean? Like you, your life goes on. <laughs> but not you. No tie. He prophesied that, and you know the Bible says, do not despise prophesying. When that scripture comes, it means that it's possible to despise prophesying. To despise is to look down on something, not consider it, not treat it as serious, not give it attention. And I think that has happened to all of us at some level before. Have you ever walked into a building and maybe not greeted the person you found at the entrance only to find that they are the ones who need to give you access and you need to come back and greet them? Mm. That is when you've despised someone. You walk in and they don't look like much so you pass them. Then they tell you, no, no, the other, they go back and that's a the man. Then you have to come back. <laughs> Hello, Sebo. <laughs> mm, how are you doing? Yes, sir, I didn't see you actually when I passed it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm also a soga like you. Eh? <laughs> hey, yeah. Now suddenly you're eating humble pie. In other words, the thing we despise, we will not participate in. Or we miss out on. So we will not despise prophesying. That if that word was given, we would rather believe it than not take part in it. But you see, we were, we, you know, a hundred years ago, a man called William Seymour, or Seymour, a black man in the U.S., from whom was birthed the Azusa Street Revival, from where Pentecostalism is birthed, and that's why you pray in tongues. He prophesied that a hundred years in, nine, in, in, in 1910, he prophesied that a hundred years from that time there would be a revival that would sweep through the world. And that, and that 100 years has come to pass in our time. Now, if you realize the things that are happening, not only at Worship Harvest, but in many other places now, PG, what, they are signs of revival. Like 1,600, 700 people getting saved in one week is not normal. Many of you know that, in fact, sometimes you jokingly start telling someone the gospel and they say, I want to get saved. You're like, hey, wait. I wasn't ready. Uh, just a minute, let me give you a video. Say these words after this person. Because you actually were not... It was like... Uh, I was just trying. Mm. I didn't expect this. Because when there is revival, there is ease. Something that's dead comes back to life. The things of God are coming back to life in our generation. Amen. And so... Apostle started last week talking about keys to revival, and you're going to hear about them this year a lot. We heard about them at camp. The people at camp, do you remember those keys? What are those keys? Praying, preaching, pastoring, planting. Those are the keys to revival, to bringing life back in the land. That God is calling us to be a praying church, a preaching church, a pastoring church, and a planting church. But then... Yesterday, we were supposed to get straight into it, and then Apostle said, but wait, you people. These are the things that we should do to sustain the revival, but there is something that is the foundation of bringing life. The foundation of revival. Where it begins. Where do you think that revival begins? What is the beginning of revival? What is the, without this, there can be nothing, not even Christianity. What, what do you suspect that is? Jesus. Jesus is where everything begins. Without Jesus, we can't even talk about revival. We can't talk about revival without Jesus. And so it's possible for us to become doers and enter the thing of praying, preaching, which, which we are going to do and we're already doing. 
and then forget that it's all a work of grace. It all begins with Jesus. Amen. So, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul writes, and you're going to read with me because let me tell you something about masks. When you're wearing them, there's warm air that flows like this. Hmm? Before you know it, you start feeding something. Then you, you keep getting up and hearing a sentence which you hadn't heard before and wondering, is she speaking funny things? No, it is sleep. It comes upon you. So one of the ways to kill it is to participate. Mm. Participate, stay alive. Otherwise, you said the woman talked. I just don't know. I kept hearing strange endings of sentences. Let's read together. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief cornerstone. In other words, when you remove him, everything falls apart. He holds everything together. That we have our beginnings in Jesus Christ. That there is no revival without Jesus. That there is no revival. There is no, we can't talk about praying, preaching. All those things are empty and they can become religious activities. And I know you've probably experienced that before. Where it's just religious activity. You're praying, you're preaching. And many revivals have died because the focus moved from Jesus to ourselves. Yeah, the revivals, they came, we're not the first ones, there was an East African revival, one of the biggest revivals in the world that still has effects up to now, in our nation. Yeah, the, there was a revival that swept through and many of our grandfathers stopped being witch doctors, we don't even know that, but really we grew up around church and Jesus and whatever and we thought it's normal, it wasn't always like that. There was a revival that hit this land, but then its effect started to die when it moved from the focus stopped being on Jesus and it became a focus on rules and regulations, behavior patterns. Christianity is not about behavior. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And instead of the door being open, it became closed because people started thinking, to be a Christian means I dress this way, I look this way, I act this way, I talk this way. That's why many of you, when you're in church, you can't be happy. Yeah, because you are taught that when you're in church, you pretend to be what you're not. You dress in the clothes you never wear from Monday to whenever. You, yeah, you wear different hairstyles. You pretend to be a person who doesn't shout and talk. Then when you're with your friends at a football match, you become yourself. The moment you walk out, you become yourself. That's the religious spirit creeping up on you. Yeah. I'm telling you. Many of you, you're not, right now, you're not yourself. Your neighbor looks at you and they think, I'm holy, holy, holy. But meanwhile, inside you have some book, crazy, crazy things. You have, your brain is there. You just, yeah, inside you're like, hee -hee. you have cartoons running around in your head. But you have to contain yourself because we are in church. When I walk out, I can be happy. Am I talking at all? Hey, if we are going to have a revival, we have to be, we have to realize it's about Jesus. And Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. So the church should be the happiest, noisiest, most chaotic, excited place. Yes. So if you have a neighbor who is scaring you, don't mind them. They will get delivered. The more they focus on Jesus, they will realize, hey, you mean I can be myself? Because you know, the one person you can't hide who you are from is Jesus. He even knows your secret thoughts, the cartoons going on in your head. He sees them. When no one else can tell, you're in a board meeting, people are very serious, you're drawing cartoons. The moment our focus shifts from Jesus to religious activity, to behavior patterns, to hairstyles, to uh, male and female, to all those things, it, that the revival is dying. Because it is, it is built on the foundation and sustained by Jesus Christ. When we all realize that without Jesus, we are nothing. We are not even able to pray. We are not even able to desire him. We are not even able to preach. We are not able to do anything. We are not able to tithe. We are not able to give fast fruit. 
We are selfish and self-centered and evil. After the demons, we are the next most evil things in the world. Without Jesus. And that makes us level. So suddenly, we don't elevate ourselves or think too highly of ourselves. But also, when we fail, we don't kill ourselves because we realize that, yeah, I am prone to failure, but thank God revival doesn't depend on me. Thank God revival depends on Jesus Christ, his grace, his power, working in you and me, ordinary people. Amen. Hey, this is so good. So, there's a text in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, from starting from verse 19. We're going to read it together. Read with me. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Let's first stop there. It pleased the Father that all, that in who? Who is this him? Is it you? Your grandfather? Your neighbor? Your very saved uncle? Your pastor? Who is this him? In him how much fullness dwells? Does all exclude some things? But guys, what is this fullness? What is this fullness? Aren't you excited about the fullness? What is it? It is not mukuto. Um, because people are hungry, they are like, yeah, indeed in Jesus is all my fullness. Because right now I feel the emptiness. No, we're not talking about your fullness of feeling satisfied. That's not the current revelation. So when you got excited, what were you excited about? Just generally, the word excites you. Even me, wama, wama. Yeah, even me, that's why I was excited. And you know, Apostle broke it down so well, hmm? this fullness thing, that I'm going to tell you that I'm going to do my best, but I, I want you to go and watch the encounter service. Hmm? Tomorrow, you can use some time. Instead of breakfast, you can watch the encounter service. Auntie, if you don't get in the word during the fast, you are on a hunger strike. And it, it can happen, you guys. It's properly. So make sure that breakfast, instead of eating food, you're doing spiritual food. At lunchtime, you step away and do something spiritual food. Otherwise, you'll have hunger strike and eat all, and, and all you're just on a diet. Intermittent fasting. I, mm. So I'm serious. Go listen to the sermon because I feel like he expounded on it so well. I, and I'm going to do my best to also expound on what I had him talk about. That in him, that, that it pleased the father that in him all the fullness should dwell. First of all, the word dwell means something lives in you. All the fullness. All the fullness. What is this fullness? Let's look at some scriptures that will help us put the fullness together. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. Read with me. For in him, this is Jesus. Hey, I'm not hearing you. For, for in him what? Dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and wait a minute the first thing we are saying is that in him dwells all the fullness of the godhead bodily in other words father son and holy spirit dwell in jesus christ in a bodily form in other words when you see the life of jesus in the gospels you're seeing the life of the father the son and the holy spirit if they were a man how they would live yeah he says if you've seen me you've seen the father okay so that jesus seeing jesus fully god fully man how he lived and what are the things that jesus lived to do he was always praying preaching and healing teaching healing that was his life performing miracles releasing life in other words when we see jesus we see the father the son the holy spirit the entire godhead dwells in him bodily but then there's another there's another part and then he says that you hmm, you and i we are complete in this jesus that they're talking about and that he we're not just complete in him but he reminds us that this jesus is the head of all principalities and powers 
that there is no power, no principality that can come against you because it is below you, because if you're in Christ and he is the head and you're complete in him, they are all beneath you. Are you starting to see the capacity he's saying you have? He, and on top of that, if, if indeed this Jesus is in you, not so. He says that as he is, so are we in this world. That he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Guys, are you with me? I need you to first be with me. Because, listen, what is, if you tell me that in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he says that, you, that, 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 that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. In other words, in your spirit, listen to me, is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are dwelling in you. You, you little you, who was born in a hospital which probably doesn't exist anymore. You, and what are the thoughts you instead thinking about yourself, the education level, school fees tomorrow, what are we going to do? Can you imagine reducing the Godhead to that? And yet I'm only showing you one part so far. That if indeed the Godhead bodily dwells in Jesus, and Jesus is in you, and you're in him. When we talk, if that's your focus, do you think there will not be a revival? If just that part alone, if you just focus on the fact that the Godhead dwells in me, as I'm going to work today, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you think you can feel that I'm disadvantaged today? When you're going into an interview, do you think you feel disadvantaged? If you're going for, for, for evangelism, do you think you'll be scared what words can I say? When you're walking around meditating on the fact that the Godhead bodily dwells in me. Do you think you'll be worried about your tribe, your affiliations, your connections, your level of education, where you live, the apartment, how small it is, the rent issues. Do you think that's what will be consuming your life? Okay. Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. Much alimu fullness. We've not yet reached. And he put all things under. This is, I want you to, every time you're seeing this, remember that this is the person in you. Guys, please. Eh? Answer me. We are together. This is the one in you. So when they say that they've put all things under his feet, they're also under your feet. Hmm? And gave him to be head over how many things? How many things? All things to the church. Mm -hmm. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in. I mean, it's like the man is trying to find words for fullness. You know, he's saying, guys, you're complete. There's nothing lacking in you. It is full. And that fullness is in you and it fills all in all. What kind of English is that? How I pray that we will receive this revelation. Because then our focus gets off of ourselves that this is the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Jesus. The fullness of the church is in Jesus. The fullness of power and authority is in Jesus. The fullness of power over principalities and powers is in Jesus. And then he says, this Jesus is in you. You're one with him. I think that if we meditate on that truth, there will be a revival. Because when I'm praying, Jesus is praying. That Jesus, that one. Everything, when I'm giving, he is giving. But look at John 1, 16. This verse always disturbs me. That fullness they've described of Jesus. Eh? Read with me. This should be one of your memory verses. Together. And of his fullness, some of us have received. And of his fullness, the prayer warriors have received. And of his fullness, what? We have what? All what? And grace for grace. On top of his fullness, he gives us divine enablement after divine enablement. My goodness. 
I don't know why you're not excited, but I pray for you. It begins with Jesus. It begins with focusing on Jesus and who he is in your life and my life. I'll make some statements that Apostle made earlier. That in Christ you lack nothing. If these things we've said are true in the scriptures, it means you lack nothing because does, is there some lack in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? There's no lack. So if they're indeed in you and you're one with them, do you lack anything? In other words, every deficiency you and I have is a knowledge deficiency. Every deficiency we have is a deficiency of knowledge, of truth. That's why when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. There was a time when I thought God was angry with me. So there was a certain separation I lived in with him. It wasn't true, but I experienced it. Because that was what I, I knew as truth. And so I was deceived and I knew it as truth. You know you can be deceived and you know it as truth. Like some people here are fearing. You can't, you're fearing to give your first fruit because there's a deception that you will starve to death. And the only way to prove that to be untrue is to give the first fruit and see if you will die. Once you do it, the power is gone over you because a lie has been set apart. In other words, if you say, I, say in Christ, I lack nothing. Say in Christ, I lack nothing. Because, guys, in him dwells all the fullness. And we have received that fullness of his fullness. We have all received and grace for grace. None of us is deficient, but you have to believe it. You have to believe it because some, you've been convinced for years that you're deficient, that you're less than, that whatever you do is not enough. And Apostle talked about it earlier, that, 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 that you have a part of you that always tells you it's not enough. If you lead two people to Christ, something tells you, why didn't you lead five? And you're here celebrating, you call yourself a Christian. Don't even be there. You see those children, they've led 17, you led two. Keep quiet. So you walk around feeling deficient. When you pray for one hour, why can't you pray for three? Eh? If you wake up and pray at 5 a.m., why can't you be like the Christians who pray at 3 a.m.? What's wrong with you? Hmm? If you read call your Bible and maybe you're trying to memorize a scripture a month, why can't you memorize 10 a week? Eh? There's always a deficiency. Something is not, it's never going to be enough. Guys, we will never be enough. We are not made to be enough. We are made to focus on him who is enough. We are made to focus on him who is enough. If your eyes are on yourself, you cannot sustain a revival, even in your personal life. Because revival is when your life changes and turns upside down. Like they can't recognize you anymore. You are timid, now you're bold. You used to be mean and broke, now you're wealthy and generous. Do you understand? That's revival. But that comes by not focusing on yourself because if you keep saying, I'm mean, I'm mean, indeed you are mean, you are mean. But when you start focusing on the fact that God is generous and I am just like him. God is generous and yes, I'm struggling right now, but I'm a generous person. It's a matter of time as you practice what you see in Christ for it to come to pass in your life. So in Jesus, we have no deficiencies. In Jesus, we lack nothing. And guys, this is why we need revelation or knowledge. Life can make you lose focus of Jesus and what he has done for you. I'm telling you, life can make you lose focus. I think that's why Paul prays for the Ephesians after telling them what they have. is like, for this reason, eh, I kneel down to the Father. I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. That you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints. Like guys, focus on Jesus. See what he has done for you. And your lives will start to come forth like light. But the enemy wants us focused on our weaknesses. Even on our strengths. Because our strengths also can be a problem. The fact that I'm focusing on what I can do. It's so limited. But what God can do is limitless. What God can do is limitless. And so we are saying that revival begins with Jesus and focusing on the fullness of Jesus, his power, his grace, his might, and how it is invested in us somehow. What a mystery. What a mystery. What a mystery. <laughs> hey. 
verse 20 of Colossians 1. And he says, and by him, maybe let's start at 19 and go to 20 so that we see the connection again. Are you able to go back to 19? No? Okay. I'll read it. 19 says, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. That's Jesus, right? And by him, this Jesus, and by him what? To reconcile how many things? All things. Verse 20 is coming any time now, Sister Vera. By him to reconcile how many things? By who? By Jesus. To himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Wow. Woo! Don't you thank God that he made peace through Jesus, not through you? Do you know how many sacrifices we would have to give just to have peace with God? No sacrifice would be enough. You'd have to be pure and perfect in your thoughts, in your living, in everything. Which is impossible. It's not difficult. But it made God so happy. It, when something pleases you, have you ever been so pleased to give someone a gift? It's someone you love, right? I remember when Pastor Ari's 40th birthday, Apostle had connived with people. And Pastor Ari walked in, clueless, for her birthday party, which they had arranged, big party, what? And all of us are trying to keep a secret of what Apostle has done. What he has done. You know when it pleases you to, to do something for someone you love? That, like, he had bought her a car and she had no clue. Because we, they dropped her from the saloon, what? She came for the party. That's how some of us still are clueless. Possibly thinking we are walking home, not knowing there is a car in the parking lot that belongs to us. That someone, out of their love for us, connived to put together just to bless us because of the love with which they love us. God has connived with heaven to bless you. Not because of anything you've done. Not because you're so nice. He's aware of your issues, even the ones people are not aware of, which you're scared that her. Huh, if these people really knew who I was. That's why some of you are like, I don't want to be a leader in the ministry. These people, they look at me on Sunday, how I dress. They don't know. Hiya! If you really know who I am, huh? You stay away. Keep your distance, pastor. Keep thinking these things, please. Eh? Don't come too close. No, 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 no. God knows and yet he has connived with heaven and hasn't even consulted you and he has gone out of his way it pleased him it made him so happy it gave him great pleasure to reconcile all things back to himself Whoop! by him things on earth things in heaven and he already said i am at peace with god oh because of jesus not because of anything you will do not because of anything you've ever done no you are at peace with God because God is at peace with Jesus. And it made him so happy. I told you, Apostle was there. He had planned. He bought the car. Pastor Ari passed by it. Every day you pass by your joy, your peace, your, your wealth. It's locked up on the inside of you, waiting for revelation knowledge to bring it to light. To be aware. Awareness. Revelation is awareness. Apostle keeps saying that light doesn't, doesn't create. It reveals. You can be in a room and you don't know where to sit because you don't know where the chair is. Not because the chair is not there, but it's dark. When you turn on the light, you see everything. That's why preaching is powerful. It turns on the light. You get to see what is available to you in Christ Jesus. You stop being robbed. Walking. All of us here, we're not deficient in joy. But you can be depressed. I've been depressed before. But all you need to do is draw it out. You start to confess, acknowledge every good thing that is in you. Because of Jesus, I have joy. I have joy. I have joy. I have joy. And before you know it, it starts to bubble over. Joy is not a function of circumstance. It's a function of Jesus Christ. Yes. It's part of the fullness that you've received. You've received fullness of joy. In his presence, there is fullness of joy at his right hand there are pleasures evermore you don't have to live poor like you don't have to have a bad marriage because all your aunties and uncles and parents had bad marriages in jesus you've received the fullness of a beautiful marriage it's available to you you don't have to have children who turn out to be drunkards and alcoholics and difficult in jesus he says that our children are taught of the lord it is fullness dwelling in you 
Through Christ Jesus, it's available as a gift. You acknowledge it. No, acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. Let me tell you, if you receive this thing, me this morning as apostle was preaching, I was like, I have to get back to these basics. Hey, we are being robbed, walking around thinking we are the ones who have to create our own joy, to create our own peace, to create our own healing. No, we acknowledge what we have in Christ Jesus and everything we build is based on that. It pleased the Father. When he thought about you and how you will be reconciled to him through the blood of his son, it pleased him to let Jesus go through that painful death because he knew that he would have you. It pleased him to see the life you would have in him, that you'd have to live as a king and a priest. It pleased the Father. I remember that day as finally at the end of the birthday when Apostle was giving Pastor Ari she even first refused to drive the car to go home because she didn't have plans. Eh? I'm driving. Eh? It's my car. We were like, and you know the thing is that when a good thing, even the people who see what you receive are happy. They are affected. That's a thing with revival. Is people look at your life and now because of what you've received, even us, we received. You understand? It, it impacts your neighborhood. It impacts your family. Yes. In Kamuli, there is a woman who was known in the village as very abusive, including small, small Bikonde for her husband. Bikonde is boxing. A Muslim man. She was beat. We met her and we met her husband. She used to beat him, abuse him. Then she met Jesus through the love of missional communities. Her life changed. She received Christ. Her husband called the pastor and said, what did you do to my wife? What? Then he said, I want to also get saved. Whatever happened, because what she received created an impact and excitement in her family. Her husband got born again. Now they are leading a, a hosting center in Namwendwa and soon are planting a church. That's revival. That that woman, instead of focusing on her weaknesses, they focused her on what she has received in Christ. And suddenly she realized, I have good behavior in Jesus. I don't have to abuse and beat people. I can actually receive what Christ has given me. When you focus on Jesus, guys, revival will come. Because we realize we have strength. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Hey! My God, this is a good sermon. Ma, 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 ma. It's good. I like it. I want to talk about the four types of separation that have happened because there is revelation for you there and you're going to receive healing. There was a separation. You see when it talks about our separation, there was a separation that, first of all, it was separation from God. You know when you don't trust God? In the garden, after these guys had eaten the fruit, don't get distracted. After these guys had eaten the fruit, the when God comes in the garden, they say to him, we heard that you were in the garden and we hid. These are the people who a few moments before, the Bible talks about how they walked with him in the cool of the day. They had constant fellowship with him. One of the things that happens is, especially when we make mistakes, you start to stay away from church. Has that ever happened to you? You stay away from fellowship, you start running. You say, I'm going through a difficult time, therefore I'm fine. You shouldn't. In fact, that's a time to come nearer. Because at that point, you're focusing on your issue and what you've done, not on Jesus and his love for you. Separation from God is when we don't trust God. And, and at some level, we all have that lack of trust of God. Yeah? The second level of separation was separation from self. And that's the most common. Where we don't, they, they, all of us have something we don't like about ourselves. Either it's a physical thing, or it's a behavior thing, or it's a... There's like a thing which you don't like about yourself. There are things which you think should be in a certain place, and they're in another place on your body. You know? So you dress in a way to hide them. I have, I have, I have someone in my life, every time... My, one of my, one of my, of my, of my friends who's a lady, every time she dresses in anything, she's looking at her stomach. And she shows you something, which for you, you can't see. You see it, why it's popping. There's like a part which pops. I'm like, where is it? All of us have something we don't like about ourselves. Ladies, gentlemen, character issues. We, we have a part of ourselves. Shame. They said we hid, we, we were ashamed, we were naked. Shame is a sign of separation from God. Shame, self-doubt. That's why everyone needs encouragement. You should be an encourager. 
when I see something nice on someone, even if it's a stranger, I'm one of those people I compliment a lot. You look nice. That's really nice hair. Wow, your skin is so beautiful. You look so lovely. Whether it's in a saloon, I don't care. I'm always telling people good things I see because you know what? Assume that everyone is carrying around some self-doubt. They always are aware that they're not good enough. So it's better to not add, to, add on to remind them. It's better to tell them when you see something. I'm not saying you don't correct, but you know what I mean. Be a lifter at your office, at your workplace. If you see good things, eh, say. Don't say, I know they know. How can you not know? You look at yourself. A pretending. You don't know you're pretty. Aye. These are, you're fishing. You're fishing for compliments. No. Just, okay, you satisfied their fishing. Separation from God, separation from self, separation from others. That's why teachings on honor bring reconciliation. At some level, either we are separated from our earthly fathers, our family, you understand? And so God gives us ways to remind us that we can be reconciled to one another. There's a separation from others. That, 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 that thing of tribes, tribalism, nepotism, color. At some level, you have some car racial thing. There are people who you probably, you find it difficult to like. Somehow, and you don't know why. Maybe they are Asian. Maybe it's white people. Maybe it's people from a certain... In Uganda, we don't have a lot of tribalism because we are 56 tribes. It's difficult to choose. So you find generally, just let's, let's live among each other. We are many. But when you go to countries where there are few tribes, tribalism is a very strong thing. And then separation from creation. That's why some of us go throwing our plastic bottles out of the car in our Range Rovers. That thing amazes me, banana peels on the road. You are just separated. Because if you loved the world you live in, you'd keep it clean. I'm telling you. But the thing of just what makes you feel like after eating, throw and walk away. Separation. Separation. And guess what? Christ reconciles all things. He reconciles us to God, to ourselves, to others, to creation. We become responsible. In Christ, it's available. You don't have to work at it. It's not a, it's not a personality issue. It's a sin issue. Separation. But as we close, in verse 22 and 23, let's first read 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 so that you see how all things were reconciled together. Now all things are of God. Who has done what? Reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Hey, and has given us. Hey, you guys, you're not excited about this thing. I think you've not understood it. He has not just reconciled you to himself, but he has given you a ministry of reconciliation that you go around reconciling. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word. Of reconciliation. That part of not imputing, I'll say something that Apostle said that I thought was very powerful. He said the sin is there but it's not credited to your account if you're in Christ. He doesn't ignore your sin. He sees it but he doesn't count it as long as you're in Christ. Why? He paid. So you don't have to carry guilt and shame. Yes, I'm a sinner but thank you Lord for Jesus. But you see, when you receive that, you become a minister of the same. You also realize, okay, Pastor Kia, you have sinned against me. The sin is there, but I choose not to count it. Because even me, they don't count mine. So forgiven people forgive. Those who realize that they've been reconciled become agents of reconciliation. In your family, you become the person who says, no, guys, let's let that go. Even us, if they counted our transgressions, who would stand? So let's let it go. Let's forgive that debt. Let's forget that issue. Let's let it go in our marriages. Let's not be holding on to things. It's okay. I see what you've done, but I don't count it against you. We become ministers of reconciliation, but it begins by focusing on what Jesus has done for us before we focus on what we can do for others. Wow. Verse 21 and 22 of Colossians says, and you who once were alienated, to, eh, you were separated once, not anymore. You who once were alienated, you're no longer reading with me. And enemies where? In your mind when you think God doesn't like me, everything bad that happens, Mananga, I think God doesn't like me. That's the devil. He's the accuser. He wants you to think you're alienated still, but he says you were once, not anymore. You're no longer alienated. You're reconciled. You're a beloved child. And not because of anything you've done, because of what Jesus has done. Once alienated, and you were enemies where? 
in your mind by wicked works. Yet now, when? 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 Now what has he done? He has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. He doesn't just reconcile you. After he has reconciled you, guess what Jesus does? Imagine a big smile on his face. He presents you after reconciling you. When you give your life to Jesus, that's why there's a celebration in heaven. He brings you and presents you. He says, look at this one. They are now holy. They are now blameless. They are now beyond reproach in the sight of God the Father. Hallelujah. Meaning that you can continue in the faith grounded and steadfast refusing to be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you had do you know how you become strong in faith you continue to focus on the love of God through Jesus grounded in that love which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I Paul I be three became a minister hey you can also put your name there and say I am a minister of the good news that God has reconciled you through Jesus you don't have to pay for your sins anymore you don't have to live in guilt and shame anymore you don't have to worry about your background anymore you have a new background and that background is Jesus Christ in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and of that fullness you have all received and grace for grace hallelujah hey my goodness Jesus presents you you don't present yourself you never have to approach God based on your goodness you don't have to ask God for anything based on what you have done but on what Jesus did he presents you he presents you holy blameless and above reproach in the sight of God and what is our response faith faith is our positive response to what God has done by grace through Jesus. And this whole month we are going to focus on that. The goodness of God. The love of Jesus. What he has done. And I promise you if you focus your eyes on that. You are going to see faith rising on the inside of you. Because you will see how loving God is. You will see his power at work in your life. You will see what he can do through you. You will no longer live in fear. You will not panic about anything. Sickness in your body. Jesus has dealt with it. Your finances and poverty. Jesus has dealt with it. Relational issues. Jesus has dealt with it. All you need to do is receive it by faith and say I acknowledge that those things are mine and start to walk in them and take actions of faith prayer preaching all those things become a result of an overflow of our focus on the goodness and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ amen are you excited do you receive this word why don't you get up on your feet right now And just start to pray in the spirit. Start to acknowledge every good thing. Maybe it was depression. Maybe it was pain in your body. Maybe it's a family issue. I just want you to respond right now. So I just say, Lord, I receive your grace. Lord, I receive your goodness. Thank you for your goodness to me, Lord. Of your fullness I have received. Of your grace I have received. Just go ahead right now. What is it that, you, that you've been feeling alienated from that is in Christ Jesus for you. Acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. And even as you respond, today I believe there are people in this room, maybe you thought Christianity is difficult. Maybe you feel it's a set of rules that is complicated. You feel like you're too weak to ever be born again. It's for certain types of people. And as I preach today, you realize this God is amazing. He just receives me as I am and gives me his life. So I want to invite you today, if you're here and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, or you did long ago and you've walked so far away, and today you're saying, I want to say yes to Jesus, or I want to recommit my walk with Jesus today. I'd like you to put your hand up boldly as a son and a daughter of God. Just put that hand up and the pastor will run to you where you are. Just put it up boldly and say, today I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Can you put your hand up where you are? Just wherever you are. The rest of us, just pray in the spirit. Don't let fear hold you back. You're saying today, I want to start my journey with Jesus. I want to say yes to him. Would you go ahead and put your hand up? I said, I saw a hand go up and go down again. Um, I Just put that hand up boldly where you are. 
Say yes to Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for that brother. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Right now he's being presented to the Father, holy, blameless, beyond reproach. If there's anyone else, just put your hand up. That's all you need to do to say, I break the hold of fear over my life. I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to walk with him. I want to receive the grace that you're talking about. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Would you bring that brother right here to the front? Walk with him. Come with him to the front. The rest of you, can you rejoice with heaven right now? Yeah, I remember myself, I think around this age is when I received Jesus. And, and, and look at me now. Thank you, Lord. Let's, let's, let's celebrate if we are celebrating. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right, we're going to pray a prayer of agreement. And you just help me and pray along with him so he doesn't feel like he's the only one in the room. Say, Lord Jesus, today I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Take my life and do something significant with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Wow, can you help me appreciate Pastor B3 for a powerful message on the basics, on going back to Jesus. So that as we do the rest of the things we do, we don't forget who it is about, what it is about. Amen. Amen. Wow. Why don't we pray? Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this young man who has given his life to you. We declare now that his life will be very significant. That he will turn many, many, many thousands to you in his generation. We refuse any work of the enemy that may seek to bring confusion in his latter years. We speak that will be surrounded by the right company all, at all times. We speak that he, his mind will open up to your word and he will start seeing revelation in the word of God at a very young age that will become a teacher of others. We bless you. We thank you. Thank you, Father, for everyone who is here today. Thank you for giving us opportunity to come here and to worship you and to rejoice in you and to give of our time, give of ourselves, give of our treasure to the glory of your name. I pray that no one who came for this service will go away and not experience a significant miracle this week in one way or other, relationally, financially, at work, career-wise, something, something. Because at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So we bless you, we thank you. I speak healing to every person who may be experiencing any kind of sickness. Father, I pray that your healing hand will be strong, especially in this season 21. That some people have carried things for years where they've had temporary relief through either medication or prayer, but then it keeps coming back. I'm praying that this season 21, it's going to be the last time the last time of recurrence I hear God saying that some people you've, you've always got victory then it comes back this is the last time we cut off recurrence of those things we bless you Lord because you're good in Jesus name Amen Amen and friends may God bless you May he cause his face to shine on you. May he give you peace. May you experience his goodness, his grace, reconciliation in your family with the people you love or with yourself. May he open doors for you. May he close the doors that need to be closed, the door of the enemy. And may he open doors of promotion, doors wells of joy may he open connections 
that are going to take you to places where he has destined for you to go. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and forever. Amen. God bless you so much. Thanks for coming. See you tomorrow at 5 for Season 21 meetings. As much as possible, please come. It's going to be really, really glorious. Thank you so much.